Hello. 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 And I seem to have chat. Um, so we're uh, we're just getting organized for uh, session number 113 of the Carl Jung Deaf Psychology Reading Group. And a couple of weeks back, I was asked to talk about my experiences overseas, and so I'm about to tell my friend Bill, uh, can you hear me all right? I hope you can hear me all right, and uh, if you are, if you can, you can say hello in the chat and let me know that you can hear me. Um, so I was going to tell my friend Bill about an experience. Ah, thank you. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, a lot is happening, as you know. We're getting ready to go on to uh, Mysterium Canionis. I hope you've been enjoying the seminar up until now. <laughs> I'm expecting more folks to be here, but at the moment it's just Bill and me, and uh, so I'm going to tell Bill when he comes back to the table, he's just going to dessert. Uh, I'm going to tell him an experience I had when I was 15 years old in Japan, uh, which in retrospect was quite wow. <laughs> But in any case, um, while we wait for Bill to come back, um, I do have chat available today, and so I will be able to uh, participate in chat, I hope, and Dan's um, message hasn't come up yet, I apologize for that. So, anyway, uh, I'll read a very short quote here uh, while we're waiting. Um, this is from my friend uh, Louis LaFontaine, who sends out emails every day uh, with various important quotes from C.G. Young. And this one is called, The Psyche Contains Many Riddles. And it's a very short quote, but uh, he says, um, the nature of the psyche reaches into obscurities far beyond the scope of our understanding. And this is, this is the scope he's talking about. He's, he's showing us a, a galaxy. It, says, it contains as many riddles as the universe with its galactic systems, before whose majestic configurations only a mind lacking in imagination can fail to admit its own insufficiency. This extreme uncertainty of human comprehension makes the intellectualistic hubbub not only ridiculous, but also deplorably dull. Okay, so that's quote number one. Yeah. So Bill, oh, um, <laughs> Last week, uh, so Dan's chat didn't show up on my iPad, um, but I'm hoping it will come up in due course, and so do try to chat. I'm going to tell very quickly um, this story from Japan, uh, because it really, in a way, it's quite surprising. So I was 15 years old when I moved and about six weeks after I moved into Kamakura, which is the ancient capital of Japan, it's the location of the great Buddha of Kamakura, and what else can I say? It was not bombed during World War II because of um, Edward O. Edwin O. Reichauer, who was a professor, I think, at Harvard, was he not? And when I was in Japan, he was ambassador to Japan. But in any case, Edward 
Evelyn O'Reichauer had persuaded FDR and Curtis LeMay, who was the head of the bombing command in the U.S. Air Force during World War II, had persuaded them not to bomb Kamakura because it was a cultural capital of Japan and it had been the capital of Japan in the 13th century. And it has many unique works of art, including uh, the Great Buddha, but also um, Tachiman Shrine, which is a very famous um, Shinto shrine where many people want to get married. And Hase Kanon, which is a, another Buddhist um, temple very near to the Great Buddha. And so there are many cultural artifacts there, both there and in Kyoto. And so my mother, who was a force of nature, insisted that we, if we were going to go to Japan, we were going to live in Japan. We weren't going to live on a military base because she said, oh, that's just little America. You, you know, you, you'll come back and you'll just be Americans. <laughs> and in a way, she was right. Um, and so, uh, so I lived in this place that was an hour train ride from my high school. And in the mornings, uh, a Navy bus, a U.S. Navy bus, would come around at 7 a.m. and pick up the few kids that lived in this remote area. And so my brother and I trundled down to the local police station every morning at 7 a.m. Now, the, the local police station was about the size of my table. And it had two guys in it. Um, but anyway, um, the bus came by every morning and picked us up. But then if I wanted to do uh, extracurricular activities, which I did during my high school years, I had to come home on the train system. So uh, one night... I went to a party, it was on a Saturday night, and on the base there were teen clubs, places where teenagers could go to hang out and play pool and all that kind of stuff on a military base. And, um, and so we could, uh, you know, there was a little snack bar there and we could play pool and we could play ping pong and uh, we could dance, there were dances sometimes. So I went to a party at the teen club one Saturday night, and I'd been in Japan about six weeks, so at that point, I, um, I'm still 15 years old, and I knew that I had to be at Yokohama Station, uh, which was, even then, was about 20 or 25 minutes away from where this teen club was, uh, I had to be there by 11 o'clock, or like Cinderella, my coach would disappear and the, I would miss the last train. So anyway, on this particular occasion, so I'm 15 years old, I'm alone, and I go to Yokohama train station. Now, mind you, this is 15 years after World War II. And I have been brought up on, um, you know, Battle Cry and uh, From Here to Eternity, those kinds of movies. So I uh, had this vision of the Japanese being very negative toward Americans. And I get to the platform in the train station, and sure enough, there's a sign that says uh, Kamakura. Uh, but I didn't know that they used the same platform for more than one train line. <laughs> so I got to the platform on time to get to the last train, and a train rolled up, sure enough. Uh, and uh, hello, Tom, welcome.
And so a train rolled up, and I thought, oh, it must be my train, right? And <laughs> so we go, uh, I go for 20 minutes, and it passes uh, a train station that I knew, which was Ofuna Station, and I knew it because Ofuna had this other canon, which was a statue of the goddess of mercy. And I very much like the Goddess of Mercy because she calmed me down on days that I was shaking in my boots because I was in Japan 15 years after World War II. And um, so the train stopped at Ofuna and sure enough I saw the Goddess of Mercy with the lights up on uh, her statue. And so I thought everything was cool. And then the train's doors closed, and the train took off, and it went at about 60 or 70 miles an hour for two hours. <laughs> and right in the way, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so I got off at this uh, train station. Um, and I've been riding for two hours on an express train, and I knew that it was not the train I was supposed to be on by that time. And uh, I get off the train, and the train leaves. And so everybody leaves the platform, and then the trainman uh, is on the platform, and one maybe 100 watt bulb, more like probably 50 or 75 watts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was dark, <laughs> and so uh, I, w I was, so it was, fortunately it was dark, and so a taxi cab drove along the track, there was a road along the track, and he's looking up on the platform seeing if there was anyone there for the last train. And uh, so uh, I flagged him down. And I don't think he thought that I was not Japanese, never a person <laughs> at, that, at that time of night. And so here, all of a sudden, so I jumped down off the platform and run over to the taxi. And I tell him, take me to Kamakura. And uh, he looked at me kind of befuddled, but he didn't know what to do with me. And so he started to drive. And he drove along the coast of Sagami Bay, which is where Kamakura is. But it took two hours. And, and one of the things we passed was uh, Inoshima, which is a, a island that I knew by that time, which is where later in 1964 the, the Summer Olympics were held. But, but this was before the Summer Olympics. And this was in 1962. And so it's by the time we get to my house, so finally he drives into Kamakura. And he gets, and once I was in the city, I knew I was safe. I knew I could find my way home. Um, and so we drive up to my house. It's now 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> and uh, so I come, come in the door and wake my father up. And I had to come up with 1,350 yen, which at that time was about four bucks. I mean, it was nothing because, because it was 360 yen to the dollar at that time. And um, and so the American forces were really ripping off the Japanese on the exchange rate. <laughs> but anyway, it was 360 to the dollar, so it was about four dollars. And the only problem was that it was yen that we have to had to pay. And uh, my father only had 400 yen left because he had been out to a Japanese restaurant that night for dinner. <laughs> and, and so he, um, he finally went out and negotiated with the cab driver. 
and he ended up settling the bill with one carton of cigarettes that had cost him a dollar twenty-five. Okay, so so this is ten packs of cigarettes were costing a dollar twenty-five at the Navy Exchange in your Coast Guard. And so he gives them, the guy a carton of cigarettes, five dollars in military payment certificates, which were uh, sort of like monopoly money that <laughs> monopoly money that the military gave us to work with on the bases and so on, uh, so that there wouldn't be a problem with greenbacks and exchange rates and so on. And so the, the U.S. military and its infinite wisdom came up with this monopoly money that we had to uh, use, which is called military payment certificates. And it was absolutely illegal to give any Japanese national <laughs> any MVC. And so my father gives this guy $5 in military payment certificates, 400 yen, and a carton of cigarettes, and the guy was happy. He was cool. So 4.30 in the morning, we settled the car, <laughs> the taxi bill, <laughs> and away the guy goes. And, you know, what I think, you know, here I was, a 15-year-old kid at that point, and when I think about that now, what an inventor. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't let a 15-year-old kid find his way home from McDonald's, right? Uh, I don't know. These days, or a lot of people wouldn't today in the United States. And yet, here I was, you know, very far from home, not knowing what was going on. Anything could have happened, but the Japanese made to the me Japan get home. Home. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours away from home. Yeah, so anyway, we'll discuss it. What decade was that? Yeah, I think that, that it, uh, Dan, I think it was uh, mainly early 60s, I guess. Because the Japanese were afraid of the Americans at that time. I mean, they still are in a sense, but, <laughs> but at that time, uh, they were very afraid of the Americans, and so we're afraid of the Americans. <laughs> yeah, and now we're afraid of the Americans, but uh, back in those days, um, they wanted to make sure that everything went hunky-dory with the Americans that were in Japan, and uh, this was after the occupation of Japan, and the occupation had ended 10 years earlier, so we weren't occupying Japan, but we were, we still had a military base there, and we still do today, which is uh, the headquarters of the Seventh Fleet. Um, but in those days, it was a little bit sketchy, and uh, so when I think back now, I, my friends and I used to go up in the Japanese Alps and ski by ourselves. I mean, when I was 15 years old, 16 years old, I guess, I was 16. And we were going up to Hakuba, which is where the Winter Olympics were held a few years back. Um, but we were going up there by ourselves, and the, the train would leave for Hakuba at 9 o'clock at night, and there'd be, I don't know, six or eight of us in the ski club, and I would be the leader at 16. And, and I had maybe one other kid that was my age with me, and then we had younger kids with us, so we had, you know, maybe down to 10-year-old kids that were on this trip, and we were the leaders. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Thomas. It's the year of the pig, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, or maybe it is already in China. Did you see the picture of the pig? No. Oh, my goodness. I have to show you this picture. I can't show it to you. It's on, it's on my... <laughs> it's on my cell phone. It's probably a good thing that I can't show it to you. Um, yeah, tomorrow, Thomas. Yes. It's the year of the pig. And uh, so, very appropriate day for it to be the year of the pig. Um, <laughs> moving right along.
Okay, so, Dr. Young was all into symbology, and I wanted to share something here with you, because over the weekend, Dr. Dr. Young thought very much that um, the Buddhists had come the closest to Jungian psychology in terms of their philosophy of life. Buddhism is not, strictly speaking, a religion. It's really a philosophy of life because there's no God, there's no apostles, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's no saints, there's no sinners. Um, it's just a way of living ethically in the world. And so one of the things that I've done in my career, and especially because I'm married to a Buddhist like teacher, is I follow Buddhism a little bit. So there's a tradition in Buddhism called the Sand Mandala. And so yesterday I went to a ceremony involving a sand mandala. And what happens is that Buddhist monks come to a place and over a period of three days to five days, they create this sand mandala. And then um, they have a ceremony. And during the ceremony, they destroy the mandala. Okay, because the mandala mm -hmm. represents um, the earth and the universe. And the destruction of it is symbolic of the destruction of the earth and the fact that everything is impermanent. Okay, and so these mandalas take on different forms, but the one that we went to yesterday was this. And I put the I put a, a a copy of this in the Dropbox so you can find this image. But in this image, uh, we have symbols of the. Um, 10 world religions and around the outside around here we have uh, the eight symbols that are very meaningful to Buddhism but it's for world peace and I'm not sure it's in my screen it's showing it backwards but I hope it's showing it forward for you um, and so it's for world peace, no one here. And, and so these, these monks one. had come uh, to Northern Virginia, and they made this mandala with the ten world religions, and so yeah. you can see there's Shinto, Islam, Judaism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, Hindu, Taoism, Christianity, Oh and God. Zoroastrian, oh, and and then uh, the uh, eight uh, images uh, around the symbols uh, around uh, are representative uh, of major ideas in Buddhism, but they also appear in all world religions. So we have uh, the continuous not. Uh, interconnectedness. Um, this is called the World Peace Mandala, and uh, you can find the description of it in the Dropbox. I was a rat, so that's Um Oh, I see it now. Yeah. And so the the second item is the conch, which is if you listen to the conch, you can hear the ocean. Well, you can hear the word of the Buddha, and so on. Um, listen to the conch, and then the lotus, and uh, the next thing is the, uh, the the vessel or vase which holds the juices of the of life, let's say, and then the, the fish. Okay, so the fish represent duality and the fact that we're all swimming in the world of duality. It's only the humans that don't accept our place in the universe, but all other creatures just be. Um, I have a cat that doesn't. 
Pardon? Does it want to be part of your universe? No. Bill has a cat that doesn't go away. Okay. Uh, this one is the umbrella. I guess the umbrella is upside down. So the umbrella protects us from um, all negative things. Uh, the wheel of Buddhism and the banner of victory. Those are the eight symbols that represent Buddhism. Anyway, if you're interested in more uh, stories about it, there there is a description uh, here of the ten religions, and there are discussions of the symbols here, and all those are in the Dropbox for today's day. Please take a look. And we have another participant, so welcome to him. Um, so, Bill, I'm sorry, I, I hogged the mic for a while. You're good. I didn't come prep for anything. I oh, just, you didn't? I was going to okay. be part of a crowd, but the crowd sort of thinned out before I got here. Yeah, well, maybe it'll thicken up. I hope it will. But in any case, here's the... Uh, Here's the young quote books in case you'd like to. Oh, uh, the quotes. You want to do the quote thing? Yeah. Well, I bought two quotes just in case. You brought two quotes? Yeah. I, oh, they're sort of at random, though, and they're kind of lengthy, so I don't know. Lengthy's good. Well, let me see. That's what I got here. I want to get these directions. Well, this one has to do with uh, uh, intuition and sensation, and this one has to do with... Sorry, I wrote these down. Copied these a few days ago. That's valid. Would you mean for This has to do with science and fantasy. They're both long, though. So. Can you give. One of them has to do with psychological types. So that they may not be. I'm, try, I'm trying to bring up the chat on the on here, but they seem to have gone away. But okay, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> well, you want me to read this quote? Yeah, read the quote. Right. I was afraid of this. <laughs> I just thought it would be my backup. Uh, the third and fourth psychological type, which one might call aesthetic types, as opposed to the rational types, which are thinking and feeling, these are the intuitive and sens sensation types. Intuitive and sensation. Both of them have mechanisms of introversion and extroversion, if you're familiar with that, in common with the rational type, which is thinking and feeling, but they do not, like the thinking type, differentiate the perception and contemplation of inner images into thought, nor, like the feeling type, differentiate the affective, affective experience of instinct and sensation into feeling. On the contrary, the intuitive raises unconscious perception to the level of a differentiated function by which he also achieves his adaptation to the world. Okay, I'll say it again. The intuition raised, the intuitive person, raises unconscious perception to the level of differentiated function by which he also achieves his adaptation to the world. He adapts by means of unconscious directives, which he receives through an especially sensitive and sharp of dimly conscious stimuli. To describe such a function is naturally very difficult on account of its irrational and quasi-unconscious character. So that was my quote. So what, why did you select that quote? Um, because I was just scrambling to get something. <laughs> but also because a few months ago I'd been thinking about it. And uh, there was a comment here, what do you call a fate noodle? And I'm sorry, um, Dan, would you repeat what the answer was? It, it got away from me. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to watch for it on the screen because uh, my iPad has become a doorstop. So I, I okay. It says, uh, and 
an imposter. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very appropriate for Sammy is here. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just I was just gonna be in a discussion and talk about it. But my way of looking at uh, you've got thinking and feeling. I sort of think of thinking and feeling as a crossbar, and, and sensation and intuition as the uh, vertical up and down bar. And you know, and then you've got your uh, your x y coordinates. Okay, we're, then, we're talking about the Myers Briggs type yeah, indicator. Right, and then of course, if you would add the introvert, extrovert, then you go through the center and you have a three dimensional uh, odding space. But anyway, so you've got up and down, you've got uh, sensation and intuition, and going across thinking and feeling. Uh, thinking and feeling to me, and to Jung too, I believe, as I recall, is it's secondary. Because first you've got sensation, which involves perception. You've, uh, you've got things coming in from the outside world. And then you've got intuition, which is your connection internally to the world. It's sort of like your connection through the horizon to other things. And you've got something coming up from there, which are intuitions. So you, it's sort of like it's a perceptual axis in a way. One thing you're perceiving sensation, the other perceiving uh, um, things coming up from within. And so, um, uh, what was the quote? Um, so that's what he's talking about there. About um, he he adapts by means of unconscious directives. That coming up from within and I was just going to bring it up because I didn't know if people had how people had thought about it because thinking and feeling seem pretty straightforward those are ways of differentiate, differentiating uh, within categories that are sort of already set where sensation and intuition are sort of things that come up and have to be sorted uh, and not necessarily sorted in terms of any of those categories because an artist uh, might uh, um, uh, capture them you know sort of on the fly so that they don't really have any you know they'll only the the after effect is you can categorize it but as it's coming forth, it's, it's part of a process. So you're not, whereas thinking and feeling sort of are already uh, almost maybe uh, culturally uh, conditioned, whereas the others are raw, sort of. You know. Yeah, well, I'm not sure because thinking, I think that we have culturally conditioned thinking. Uh, so uh, Jordan Peterson was all into logos and thinking, and um, you know when I think about this, I think of, uh, because I fall at the 99th percentile on the intuitive scale. I'm 100. And you're 100. <laughs> percent Is there such a thing? I'm 100. percent INFP each one. Are you? Yeah. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah. 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 So, I've always been extreme. Any test they give me, so, so Bill, and, Bill and I are yes, trouble so because we don't know what we don't know. In other words, I'm blind to the facts. Okay, sensing is about getting all the facts. So. I sort of joke about the spectrum that you can show a, a sensing person a thousand trees and they won't believe there's a forest, but you can show an intuitive person three trees and they believe that there's a forest. I'm lost. Pardon? I'm lost. Yeah, I'm lost in the forest tree. And, and so, so the, the problem with that from a personality point of view is that whenever some a thinking person comes to me with facts I don't know what he doesn't know I have instant uh, reactions to it and I have a global view of it. would you describe it that way I mean if a thinking per or I'm sorry the sensing person comes to you 
and he starts to de describe a bunch of facts, sense facts, things that things in place to you. Um, at what point do you? I mean, you'll get something, but but you really don't know what he doesn't know because you already grok it. Well, I don't know. I've always been able to, maybe because I've always been an artist, right. and I've always worked with having to make things concrete, right. um, so that I could uh, communicate. And, and not that I was trying to communicate, I was trying to understand myself. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the other extreme. One time I got fired from a job, and you know why? Because there was a there was a homeless guy. This was back in the early 70s. And a homeless guy came up. And I was sitting outside the front of an antique shop where I was working, and I was taking a smoke break, and I was just sitting there. And he came up, and he was speaking in, in you know word salad. He was just he was just a crazy man, uh -huh. but I understood him. You understood yeah. him. <laughs> and I spoke back in word salad. I understood what he was saying, and I could speak. I could make. My, my words were concrete, you know, sort of like Rimbo or something, and I, was, I, was just, I, would, I, I could respond to him. And we were talking back and forth and having the best time. And the, the owner of the place came out and saw us, and he said, you're, you're scaring people away. He <laughs> said, go home. <laughs> uh, but we, we knew we were having fun. We were, we, we were making sense to one another, though, I mean, it, you had to you had to get into the so being intuitive I could I could handle the very concrete kinds of imagery you were right. dealing with. Right. Right. So I'm not sure that's sounds like Nancy, are, you, are you familiar with what we're talking about? The Myers Briggs type. Yes, thing. yes, uh-huh. Okay. Right. And and have have you had a I've screen? not had that but I've had a similar test, Kobe Kobe test that would kind of follows along the same but different you know, the same. Right. Thing. But have you had an experience where where people don't understand you because they're of a different personality type? You've been married, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I've been married, yeah. You've been married. I've been married. <laughs> Let's get that out there first, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that right there, yeah. you've already met someone who doesn't. Jen is here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah. The crowd thickens. So what was your question? So, so have you had an experience where you recognize that you're at a certain position on the personality scale Mm -hmm. And you're not able to understand, um, you're not able to know what the other person doesn't get because of their personality. Right, and so my job is always dealing with many personalities, you know, the basic personality types that I have to really try to be flexible to understand and communicate with. But you're absolutely right, sometimes you don't understand what they don't know and what they're trying to say. You don't know what they don't know. Exactly, but you, but you have to communicate in a style to them that they'll listen. Right. The way so, they want to listen to you. Yeah. So, so this is an issue, folks, that, that there are these 16 personality types that come up from Jung, but uh, on those four scales that produce those 16 personality types, mm -hmm. um, you can be anywhere on those scales, so there's really an infinite number of mm -hmm. possible personality types. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. and, so you have to try to understand where the other folks are coming from. And my problem was I didn't get what they didn't get. <laughs> I mean, I always got it right away. So, <laughs> John, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good to see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got delayed at the grocery store, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's right. Um, so do you have a quote for us? I do. Oh, yes. you do? Okay, good. Uh, but but it's before one that I'm a little but, perplexed John, before, about. before, you, before we do yours, let's sure. do one from Nancy. No, she can do that. That's okay. He's, I'll pass. Okay. I'll pass for right now. You'll pass for yeah, now. Okay. Is. All right. Okay. So this go is, ahead, John. But I, but I do want to say, I think what I read once the other day, don't really kind of 
made those two words, introvert and extrovert, more predominant in the psychology field. Like, made them more classifications. Yeah. You know, he, he was the one. We could he say was he, really the he one coined that, created, that word. We could say he coined the word, but he, he created that awareness mm -hmm. of those two words. I thought that yeah. was interesting. Which two words? Yeah. Introvert and extrovert. Oh, yeah. Yes. Now we call them management and IT. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> And how, how do you differentiate? Which is introvert and which is extrovert? Well, I think it's introvert. You know, they're working on their machines and they don't like to be bothered, and management wants to bother everyone. Okay. <laughs> and they're out. They, they, they want to have meetings. Let's get together and have another meeting. <laughs> I got you. So. All right, so mine is from this book that you recommended, which I love this book. I just spend so much time with this book, and it's, uh, okay, you want to put it in front of the... John is talking about this book, which is uh, C.G. Young's Psychological Reflection, a new anthology of his writings, 1905 to 1961, Yolanda Jacoby and R.C. Hall. And R.C. Hall was Dr. Young's major translated throughout his life. So, so I chose a quote from the man and the woman section, page 110. And I understand the first part, but I don't understand the second part. So uh, I'll read it. It's pretty short. Okay. The love of woman is not sentiment, as is a man's, but the will that is at times terrifyingly unsentimental and can even force her to self-sacrifice. A man who is loved in this way cannot escape his inferior side, for he can only respond to the reality of her love with his own reality. <laughs> That's sort of like pretzel logic there. Where I mean, <laughs> there's something well, I don't uh, understand about that second sentence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I still we're we're going to read this again. Um, all right, so the quote really is from that page 110. It's a fair that's, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The quote is, I'll read it once again. The love of woman is not sentiment as is a man's, but a, a will that is at times terrifyingly unsentimental and can even force her to self-sacrifice. A man who is loved in this way cannot escape his inferior side, for he can only respond to the reality of her love with his own reality. Oh my God. The, the inferior side would be the feminine side. According, right. Inferior side would be the feminine side. Right, right. So he cannot respond fully to, to her love in the sense that he's a man. He does not have, that's his superior side, right? Is that what he's saying? We need that quote in front of us. <laughs> we can't remember it. Okay, well, well here, here it is. Let, let's break it down because this is a very complex idea here. Let me just, let's just check and see where it's from. It's 114. Okay, so, I'm trying to remember what so, said so this quote, quote is from quote Women in Europe Somehow from Collected Works 10, Civilization in Transition. And obviously, the war between men and women is a this big is thing. Team. Okay. We need a wall. <laughs> and, and says the, and the oxide says the here says the obnoxious women in the background are killing me. <laughs> okay, so let, let's take this one piece at a time. Okay, the love of woman is not sentiment. Okay, because so that phrase, let's just take that phrase. Okay. What do you mean by women, sentimental? Women tend to be sentimental, okay? and so the love of women is to project out something they don't have, right? And so they're 
in love with something that isn't Happy. sentimental. That's the dark side. That's the they, they, they shadow like side, right? Uh, one hour of would you concur with that? Saying, is he saying like the archetype of the woman? Is this? Uh, this is this is not archetype of a woman per se, but it, it's from the feminine side of the. Like this, players, you know, the traditional so sentimental, uh, the traditional archetypal side of the feminine, not a woman per se, but so the feminine principle says that um, you're sentimental, okay, if you're thinking in terms of the feminine principle, mm -hmm. women tend to be sent sentimental and therefore she's looking for wholeness okay we have to remember here uh, masculine is incomplete without the feminine correct and and that's that's the point that all of us have to all of us are incomplete and all of us need to find uh, that which we are not and hopefully we find that in a partner relationship whether whether it's gay or heterosexual it doesn't matter if, if you're one way you find a partner that has the aspects of, of wholeness that you do not have because none of us are whole and, and so that's the point of partnership, okay. and that's the point of yin yang. I mean, that's the yin yang symbol. Actually, that, you know, if you're if you're all masculine, then you're all black on the yin yang side, and and you're looking for a partner who's all white to balance balance out your life and give you wholeness. Well, All right, go ahead. what I'm getting from that first sentence is that a man uh, uh, has, it's, it's, uh, you know, you see women as, uh, in a very different way than women see men. I, I think what he's saying in the end of the sentence is that women see men more functionally and women and men. Women see men as more in a more functional way and love them in that regard, whereas the man sees the woman in a um, emotional way. Yeah, it's sort of like he he has a, especially you know in our day and age where men have a big vacuum in there. So because we we we're not allowed to have feelings and so forth we're allowed to have it with a woman and so we can just suffocate a woman with our sentimentality whereas the woman is focused more on uh, well she's got a lot of things at stake i mean she's gonna have kids she needs somebody that's gonna stick around she needs all this functional stuff so that's how i read the first sentence all right yeah so so the love of the woman is not sentiment it's it, it, it it's looking for something functional it's going to support her while she is in childbearing stage at least and also support her later in life you know, because debbie and i for example are far beyond childbearing years but uh, we now support each other in other ways but um but so the love of a woman is not sensitive okay as is a man okay so a man is not looking for functional he's looking for sentiment exactly okay because that's his shadow side and all of this can force her into self-sacrifice what is that about but she always okay. women self-sacrifice they do but i'm just wondering how she what the, in the dynamic she wants that function so badly right. So it's not, it's, it's not, have no. Yeah, it, it's sort of like she has to yield to the center. Right. You, she has to take the projection and, and live with the projection yeah. because she's getting what she wants. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. Now we go to the last sentence. <laughs> How are you relating that, what you just said, to this passage, though? 
What? The level? Oh, the self-sacrifice part. Okay, well, I got yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, that's very astute, Bill. Thank you. A man who is loved in this way cannot escape his inferior side because she's going to feed the inferior side, the sentimental side, because right. that serves her. Right. Uh -huh. And so he gets trapped in his son. He, so he never grows up. <laughs> yeah. So that could create all sorts of, that would be a real tricky, that's a real, no wonder we have so many marriage problems. Yeah, no wonder. Nancy, go ahead. Was that whole quote extrapolated from a series of other discussions? From an essay. From an essay? Yeah. So what was the other part of the, what was preceded it and what came after it? Like, right. You know, I think it's like we're taking it out of context. I'm trying to see what else he was relating to. Yeah, we're just projecting our own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we are. That's true. Uh -huh. And so I have added you to our Dropbox. Is that right? Okay, yes, but I haven't checked it. Yeah, okay. you, you did. So, yeah. so in our Dropbox okay. is a subfolder called the Collected Works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in there is a little treasure, and that treasure is all of the collected works of C.G. Young, 20 volumes in electronic form. And so whenever we come up with something like this, mm -hmm. where we don't understand it, we can go and pull out of that Dropbox that volume and actually look at it. Uh, most men, you know, yeah, he says most men are afraid one. of something yeah, and are full of prejudice, man, which, I'm sorry, I, I lost the rest of it. Um, but, so, well, the point is that, that here, she can use it to her in this book, we have um, you know, the, 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 the essay that it was spoken from. So, mm -hmm. this is 114 in this yeah, book, yeah, and, yeah. and that's a specific essay called Women in Europe. Okay. Okay. And then the other number that's here is 261, and so that's paragraph in very different that essay. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Paragraph number, which if you look at the collected words, you'll see every paragraph is numbered. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. So the 20 volumes, and the last two volumes, volume 19 is bibliography, and volume 20 is index. But the first 18 volumes are all essays by C.G. And so, <laughs> when we refer to things that Jung said, if we refer to mm -hmm. a paragraph number, we're talking about a specific paragraph within the collected works. Okay, so okay. we need both the volume and the paragraph number. And so this, yeah. this is uh, Women in Europe, which we know to be volume 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's what this book, in the back says, a woman is more likely to acknowledge her own duality. Uh, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I don't have time to read the whole thing, Andy, because it disappears too quickly from my screen, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I suppose that's true. You think women recognize their duality more readily? What duality? Duality other stuff. I mean, do, do you think women acknowledge their shadow side more readily than men? Do you think that, John? Mm, I, do men acknowledge it? I think, that, I think that they're more aware of it, but I don't know that they acknowledge it as easily. Uh -huh. Okay. I've never thought about it. Yeah, I think most men don't think about it <laughs> until they run into C.G. Young. Well, no, I've thought about my own shadow, but I don't, have never thought of it as a, you know, a, uh, a race between the, the, mm -hmm. the women and men. I just figure uh, we're all pl plugging away at the best we can and doing it when we no. can. And no. given all the different, you know, variables and all the circumstances, I don't know that anyone's ahead of anyone else. But maybe there's a, you know, a, a, an adaptive reason why women would be more aware. I just, I, you know, I, when you just talk about dualities or shadow and that sort of thing and, and maturity, um, I, 
I don't know. I I think men don't have to face responsibility as early as women do. So in that regard, maybe women are well, accelerated. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that that men don't appreciate the responsibility that you take on when you have a child. Okay, mother is a mother. Okay, well, she's she's always a mother. And also, um, you just don't have, you never think about the fact that some alien's going to come leap into your body and take over, you know? <laughs> and all of a sudden, your life has changed for 20 years or more. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say that I think that the, that the shadows are actually helpfully developed in relationships, both ways. Well, that's what I think that too. I mean, that's the yin yang yeah. thing, and the fact that you need a partner to help you um, see your shadow, if if you will. Okay. And this this is why I always joke about the coffee mug that I gave Deb, which is if a man speaks in a desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? <laughs> and the answer is why yes, yes he is. <laughs> That's hilarious. And the reason he is, I, I mean, and the fact that we're laughing about it is that that's in the shadow, right? It's a deep joke. But, but, uh, and that, and that's a secret of humor, by the way. You always want to hit somebody else's shadow and that that's what makes something funny but but <laughs> thank good i don't thank goodness i don't take my wine in full form <laughs> yeah. okay but um but the point is that um we only there is duality in life and mm -hmm. And Jung was all about the opposites, okay, which is another way of saying duality. And uh, and so the point is that, let's see what Thomas says, we men get caught up in our own male heads. It took me forever, I'm sorry, Thomas, I lost it again. Um, but the point is that, that we're all caught in these opposites okay we get our psychic energy from the fact of opposites and there's a thousand of them, thousands of them not a thousand maybe millions of them but but for everything that is there's an opposite for everything there is there is an opposite and but all there is are representations and all representations exist along uh, dichotomies you know there's a, there's only you know well, there's yes he, no yeah he he calls it opposites some people call it uh, duality I mean, dualistic thinking um, uh, I like I like other things that sound a little more complex like differential play or signifier right. okay <laughs> so so the significance of this is psychic energy that we have no psychic energy without duality and I really urge everyone to watch or to read this book called um, Psychic Energy, Its Sources and Its Transformation, which is by e. uh, Esther Hardy. Okay. It's an old book. It's available in used books online. Uh, it's available in the Dropbox under Esther Harding. Esther? Esther Harding under... Esther Woman. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Esther Woman, <laughs> Esther Harding. <laughs> but the point is that if, without duality mm -hmm. and without having the distinction, okay, I mean, Jung used to give a very simple example, which was a waterfall. Water is going to come across a certain level and then it's going to fall down to a lower level and that creates energy and okay so you can put a, a turbine in there and create energy and then heat pulls the water back up in the sky and causes it to drop back down as rain okay so this is a continuous process 
of energy being created in different ways, okay, and it's a cycle. And so everything that happens in the psyche comes from this duality, and if you don't have it, you're dumb as a slug. I <laughs> mean, you're, you're a rock, you're well, stone. You have nothing. Because you, you have nothing. You, because you exist only within those dualities, as you call them. Right. Because you only have representations. We're, we're you know, it's, it, we're like Dalton Trumbo's, uh, uh, who's the guy that has no, he has no way to communicate outwardly or anything. He has no limbs, no face, no nothing. And if the only thing we can, you know, it sounds Bar Barkleyan, but we really only have our representations of stuff. We live in a virtual reality, our own little virtual realities that right. we have collectively, you know, the collective hallucination, uh, Gibson calls it, that that we share, and so we can tran, you know, we we can. Right. So so if we don't have a, a partner. Who reflects our inferior That's side. a different duality, okay. Yeah, but if we don't have a partner that reflects our inferior really side, <laughs> whether it's femininity or whether it's intuition or whether it's emotion, whatever those inferior things are, if we don't have a partner that reflects that and therefore causes some something to happen, it, then we become slugs. And, and so you have to have uh, a partner who creates that energy going back and forth. Now, I think of the sun and the moon. You know, the yeah. sun radiates some energy and the moon reflects it back. <laughs> and then you, we've each got a sun and moon in us and we go back and forth with each other. And, yes. and what you get reflected back, you know, Precisely. tells you how, how things are going in terms of what you're getting, generating. Right. And, and and so this is this is why I say that you know if a man speaks in the desert and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? Well, yes, he is because he's only half of the story, and and that's the issue. And there's no psychic energy without that. And in terms of this Myers Briggs stuff, um, the uh, what was I going to say? The dualities of each function. Well, uh, you know, in in terms of the Myers Briggs stuff. Oh, I know what I was going to say. In terms of uh, marriage. Okay, here's mm -hmm. advice for you. Mm -hmm. Find out what your damn Myers Briggs type is, and you want to have two or three of those types Comment. the same mm -hmm. with your spouse. If they're all different, if you have four scales that are all different you have constant conflict. If you have four scales that are all the same, like tea, then you're dull as slugs in your marriage. And so you need psych psychic energy to keep That's things going, to keep things moving. And if you, don't have, if you don't have disagreements and different points of view, then, then it's dull as I, I'm not going to judge dull. anybody. <laughs> Pardon? I'm not judging anyone. Some people yeah. like dull. <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, you have to have something to get you going, right? So, I mean, I'm an introvert, so I really like having an extrovert around who wants to go to a party because otherwise I'm just going to sit home and, and uh, watch television, right? Oh, you got to find somebody. You have to find a partner. I don't sit home and watch television. And I'm an introvert. Yeah, but I mean, but you know who I attract? I, I attract field marshals, <laughs> people who come on back gangbusters. These women, let's go do this. Come on, and I'm out there going. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so, so you attract extroverted women who want to take you out and make you do something, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, so you're happy okay. to do it. Okay, so no, I'm going, okay, beat it. I've got the work to do. I'm right. going to sit here and work yeah, on so, so yesterday <laughs> I went to this Buddhist event with my wife, who's the Buddhist Lama. Um, and, and I really enjoyed myself. I enjoyed it very much. And, uh, but um, if, if it had been me, if that email had come across just to me, and I saw that come across, I said, eh, I don't really want to do that. You know, 
That's, yeah, I like to do it with somebody. I have to admit. Yeah, you have to have somebody that does drink. That's when you want to drink it. Right. Extrovert over, so let's go do that. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so so stupid from having lived with Fortunately, you, even though Debbie and I are both <laughs> introverts, <laughs> she's yeah. a little bit closer <laughs> to the extrovert. <laughs> so right she pulls me out to do things. That's the that's the point. <laughs> okay, so uh, Nancy, it's your turn to give us a quote. Um, uh, I'm trying to connect again the dots here with women in Europe um, and maybe they, this is just jumping around so maybe this doesn't mean anything because um, I haven't necessarily read it through enough. Human imperfection is always a discord in the harmony of our ideals. Unfortunately, no one lives in the world as we desire it, but in the world of actuality where good and evil clash and destroy one another, where no creating or building can be done without dirtying one's hands. And this is also from women in Europe. Hello. <laughs> wow. Well, the first word that popped out to me was ideal. Right, yeah, me too. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. No, I, I can't remember the rest of it. I just remember the the idea of ideal right there would create, you know, tension because nobody's gonna, mm -hmm. you know, meet the ideal of well, anything. Well, yeah, nobody lives up to an ideal. Right, human imperfections is always a discord in the harmony of our ideals. Imperfections, imperfections determined by what? An ideal. Right, mm -hmm. and, and re remember Dr. Young said, uh, at one point, that, that men are into perfection. You know, just give me the rules and I'll just do them perfectly. You know, and that's the ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, and and women know that you know there's nothing ideal. There's nothing perfect. Well, and they they go it's just for not their approach. Yeah, they yeah. want to. They, they want, want a family. They want to create the family. They want the relationship. The the discussion. The, you know, they don't want to just let it go. You know, like a, you know, like a hammer blow. They want to. They want to. It's something that I think women see it sort of as a living process, and men see it as something you finish and go on from. <laughs> right, and, and, and so on Super Bowl weekend, if the men are sitting around watching the Super Bowl, the women are making a meal and presenting a meal. I don't watch that. Well, okay, so some men don't watch the Super Bowl, but, or any sports but, um, but except but, girls playing tennis. You know, <laughs> women know that one of the teams will win and one of the teams will lose, and at the end of it, you still have to have a family, right? That's what they know. Right? I mean, that's what the feminine knows, whether it's a woman or not. Um, well, it's not all family, but yeah. I mean, idea. well, the, yeah, but the point is the relatedness. Yeah. yeah, you have to you have to stay related, whether your team wins or loses, right? And and so the men are totally into the idea ideal of winning or losing, and they're totally trashed out if their team doesn't win. <laughs> Can you believe that? That's so ridiculous to me. I mean, yeah. anyone identifies but, with a team but, or anything. Is, yeah, but uh, the problem is you can't you can't have all wins. Okay, the the funny one that came out. The fact out, that you even want to have a win lose, you know, is that zero sum, you know. That well, idea. but you, but you have to because can uh, consider what happened with the Super Bowl. Okay, so the Super Bowl comes comes out and it happens and. And so Major League Baseball digs Boston, okay, immediately after the Super Bowl, Major League Baseball put out a tweet that said, um, oh my God, it's been so long since we've, we've passed the drought of 98 days. <laughs> <laughs> Since the last World Championship Boston had, right? <laughs> 98 days? 98 days since the World Series. Oh, really? Presumably, I, I don't... See, I don't even know that. <laughs> I, don't even, I didn't even pay attention. You know, when you get a little older, maybe you don't pay attention, but... I didn't. I never did. <laughs> I just never cared. Well, I haven't paid attention for a very long time, but... Um, 
And, but presumably Boston won the World Series, okay? Yes. And so 98 days oh, later, geez. Boston wins the Super Bowl. And oh my God, the drought's over, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and somehow it's hard to get excited when your when you're sports teams are always winning. I mean, we had it here in Annapolis uh, where, where Navy won for like 14 straight Army-Navy games, yeah. right? And it got to the point really? where, yeah, wow. and and it got to the point, even though I was brought up to say, you know, go Navy beat Army, mm -hmm. it got to the point where I was saying, oh my God, I hope Army finally wins the game, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, let's, let's, because otherwise, let's shake it up a little, it, it, it's yeah, just, exactly, it's yeah, just boring as sun, that's where the psychic energy comes from, though. I mean, if, if I'm all for Army winning once every four years, okay? They don't, I, I don't want them to win a lot, but I want them to win every four years because I don't want any cadets going out into the Army without ever having a win because those will be totally <laughs> with defeated guys. Demoralized. Right? Before they demoralized start. guys. And uh, guys, that brantle? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's deep unconscious. <laughs> well, that's real ego-based stuff there. I'm going to run over and get myself sure. shot and get it over with. Sure it is. <laughs> you want to give us another one? Yeah, this is interesting. So here's one, totally we're off some, this new topic, but all about good and evil and light and depth and dark and shadows and so forth. This one says, in dealing with darkness, you have got to cling to the good, otherwise the devil devours you. You need every bit of your goodness in dealing with evil and just there. To keep the light alive in the darkness, that's the point. And only there your candles make sense. So you're in a dark place, you just don't give up. You right. don't give up and get devoured with right. and what's what, coming what, in. What's the source of this? The source is letter to Victor White. Uh, letter to Victor White. Mm -hmm. sure. He was the priest. Yeah. So so Victor Victor White was a Franciscan brother. Okay. Uh, uh, and or no, I'm sorry. Victor White. He was a Dominican. Oh, huh? He was a Thomas. So what's a Thomas? Mm, no, no. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas. Okay. So I think he was Jesuit. Dominican. No. He was a Dominican brother. Okay. And he, a Dominican father, he was he a wasn't priest. Church of England. No, no. <laughs> he was a priest, and he and he was um, he was a teacher at. Cambridge, and he was a you know a primary professor at Blackfriars House at Cambridge. So it was a place where uh, Dominican priests went to be trained. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, uh, so he had a very tough period right before World War II, and. He wanted to write to Dr. Young about it, but World War II came up, and he couldn't really deal with it. And meanwhile, he had had an experience with a Jungian analyst in Britain before World War II. Okay, so World War II goes along, and after World War II, he writes to Young. While Young and Father White mm -hmm. became very close confidence and correspondence and, and Victor White after World War II spent about 10 years coming to Bollingen and, and having all these interchanges with uh, Dr. Young. So, so that's the source of this quote. Mm -hmm. So the quote, Dr. Young is saying that, you know, you have to keep I'll read it again. Yeah. You have, so these young, the young white letters, where there are a series right. of letters. Right. They're, yeah. There's Plural. a whole book of uh -huh. letters. Okay. And so this was actually written 53, 1953. Right. So, okay. so it was in the middle of this period. Mm -hmm. In dealing with darkness, you have got to cling to the good. 
otherwise the devil devours you. You need every bit of your goodness in dealing with evil and just there. To keep the light alive in the darkness, that's the point. And only there your candles make sense. The meaning of the well, last I mean, half. Only there are the candles make that sense. Edinger's, little bits of light. Mm -hmm. One of the things Edinger says is that the human child has to believe that it's good. Okay, if it doesn't, a child is crushed, and and it's good with a capital G. So oh it's yeah, like a thing. Good it's with a, a, good, yeah. Uh -huh. You're a good boy, you're a good girl, yeah. you're my princess, all that stuff. Because children don't have an ego yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they can't decide what's good and bad. So they need mom and dad to affirm that they're good and they're they're a real child and mm -hmm. and yes, you're on a track to be a real human being, a mature human being. Right? That's what that's one of the things you have to learn when you're growing up. And if your parents don't do that for you, then you're destroyed. I mean then then you know, either you collapse mm -hmm. in childhood or you know, maybe you are one of the twenty two veterans who commit suicide every day type thing. I mean mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, just think about it for a minute. What, um, why did dad never talk about his time in the, in the service? Okay, and that's a very common experience that families, their fathers don't talk about their time in the service. You know, people nowadays would come back from Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan and they'd be just silent about it. Okay, because what you experience in warfare is palpably evil. Okay, there's no doubt about mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you can only interact about it with another guy who's been through it. Okay, but but you can't share it with your wife and have her. It help seems you with like it. yeah. It seems like you would be so concerned about saying the wrong thing because. You were around these guys, these other people who were killing, maiming, destroying, mm -hmm. you know, doing all of this stuff. And right, you had to well. distance yourself from it in order to deal with it. Right. And then if you come back here and speak with that same sort of uh, attitude, uh, people around you would just be totally alarmed. They wouldn't know what to think of it. Or if you bring it back and you can't stop it, then you're also a threat to everyone around. Right. But i just wondering if, my biggest problem with the thing is when he talks about the good and the evil. Uh, those are those are very kind of Christian ideas to me right. that I don't relate to, and I, I, I'm still struggling with those because I can understand darkness and light, mm -hmm. but when you label them good and evil, they sort of take on a, some baggage that. Uh, well, they do. That, That's right. But but it's it's a baggage that sort of deposited before I got there. You know, it's sort of like I, I want to experience the dark and light and not have someone call it evil or good before I've even, you know, found a way to relate to it. So. Hey, are you relating, because it would be a, an expression that you would say God would decide what's good and what's evil? No. There's a, a, a God-like My like problem is, is I'm not sure there is any good and evil. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that, I think it's, those are our interpretations. Well, and, to some extent, but it's like pornography, you know, when you see it. Well, I, it's, it's not that way to me. Yeah, but I, I mean, you know, I can, I, I if somebody's see. trying to kill me and they've just killed my family or something, I would label it as evil. But if I back up away from it, you know, I could say it's a natural disaster. I mean, is that good or evil if a natural disaster no. did the same thing? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. No, well, then, sure. you know, then I'm wondering, you right. know, right. okay, then we're talking about uh, free will and things like that. And then it gets all complicated again because I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the favorite topics of the young men that we have on our channel here is <coughs> pornography. Okay what about it, whether it's good or evil. Well, um, it depends on how it's produced, I think. 
but you know the reality is so you either figure out a way to deal with it or I don't know but see you know, even that it. even that you know I, I think of Aqualon you know <laughs> Aqualon yeah you know that song no. Uh, that's what, I'm sitting there with a friend of mine, and we're watching these co-eds go by. We're in our know, like late forties, and he's going, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the park bench, <laughs> and watching the <laughs> girls go by. <laughs> but it's it's sort of like you know you're drooling. So deep, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know, but it, it's sort of that thing, you know. I mean, it's like you said, you we we have to deal with that uh, but to say you know how much of it is is evil because it's not know, evil well oh, wait, wait wait a minute can we straighten something out right away that yeah go ahead i was not judging pornography what i was saying was i was making that analogy and i was just sort of making a joke because it's you know the court the supreme court or whatever we we're on the spectrum said yeah. that um you know when you see it I was just using it as an analogy for good and evil. So I was not associating pornography with good or evil. I was just yeah, using but it. but I, I think the Supreme Court has pretty much ruled that even if you see it, it it's not prohibited by the Constitution. Okay. But that's not but my I point. My point was just, I was just saying. As long as no one's exploited, maybe, or something. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a point where we have to have common sense about whether we feel something we value go back. we make a i guess it still would be a judgment we make a judgment of, of something as good or evil we right. try to avoid okay and, and and so so this is why Wait, dr yeah. dr Young was concerned about being cut off from our instincts okay because our instincts which are the unconscious have come up since we were single cell organisms three and a half billion years ago mm -hmm. and every one of us is descended from parents and grandparents going all the way back to single cell organisms who successfully reproduced okay we all successfully reproduced back to the beginning and that's what the unconscious is and and so we already know innately the difference between right and wrong, right? And, and the problem is when somebody starts to tell you the difference between right and wrong, then you have to examine the spirits. Okay, this is, this is the famous Christ quote in 1 John 4, 1, 1 John, letter to John first letter of John 4 1 which says you know examine the spirits because many false prophets have come upon the earth and what he means is that that we have to we have to be connected to our instincts and Dr. Young was very concerned that in modern society where we live in, in cities and so on and we don't get out of nature and we don't have much interaction with nature maybe other than our sexual relationship with our spouse um, we we are no longer connected to the natural wisdom that is there that comes through to us from our ancestors from forever right and and so that's the issue Okay, you can't be cut off from your instincts. So, all the... But how are you relating that to good and evil? I'm not sure I understand. Well, because, because of pornography as an example, okay? Um, you know, you, you can't be cut off from the fact that, um, that men produce semen that you have to do something with or you've got serious problems, psychological problems, probably, if you're not dealing with that production. And you either have a woman that's going to help you with that, or it's going to help you with that, or 
you're going to have to have something else that's going to help you with that. Now, Jung was very uh, you know, circumspect, you know, circumspect about the way he said it, but he he said that you know nothing is simpler. You simply fantasize and and take care of it, right? But but in fact, take care of it, right? But but in fact, we don't fantasize that well anymore. Okay. Instead, we expect to see something on a screen to, to address our fantasies. And, and so, uh, so, uh, you know, so the issue is, okay, there's an issue of how the pornography is produced. Yes, I agree with that. Um, you know, if it's exploited, then it's a problem. I agree with that. But at the same time, we've got you know, whatever it is, three and a half billion men, and let's say two of them, two billion of them are mature men, and they've got to deal with that. Um, and and how are they going to do it? Um, and and how are they going to do it? Okay, especially after age, let's say, 60. It's an issue. I mean, what, why, why do, okay, so there's a, there's a tradition in, in China that the ideal age for a woman, for a man, is one half his age plus seven years. Okay, there's a reason for that. Okay. And that is the women are very interested in sex later in life. Okay, they might still have some interest in it, but you know, after after age sixty, that sort of goes away. And are you going to disagree with me, Bill? No, I'm just trying to imagine away. hanging out with a forty what three year old or forty four year old. <laughs> That's another world. Well, that's yeah, that, that's the I mean, in my life. Yeah, yeah but remember, those are, remember China. Justice Black, right? Justice Black was like 74, and he, he had a clerk who was 30. And... Well, yeah, it, it happens, but it's yeah. it's hard to. I mean, I can I can see it in a functional way, but beyond that, it's it's kind of. Seems like you would have an empty seat next to you. <laughs> well, yeah. The point is that we have, to, we all have to evaluate these issues for ourselves. Yeah. Okay. There's no put your priorities there. Yeah. Yeah. There's no societal yeah. answer. I don't think. I think if you devote yourself to young and study every day, you won't have this problem. <laughs> uh, Let's get off of male sexual stuff. Okay. Yeah. Fine. All right. Go ahead, Nancy. I was wondering if in dealing with the darkness, he, he was also referring to the shadow. Sure. You know, so you could substitute those words shadow in places yeah. where... And the shadow's going to seem evil. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to label it evil because it's right. everything that you don't want. You don't, you well, don't want but, to deny but it's or... not only everything you don't want. It's also uh, instinct and a bunch of other things that you do want. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go down that road, I, I could get into a lot more than just... Uh, Your instinct road? No, it's the whole... It, it's... Uh, I won't go there. It has to do with... It's philosophical, philosophical kinds of things, like epistemologies and... and uh, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm fine with that. I like that word. Epistemology mean, it means the study of the sources of knowledge, right? All right, what were we talking about? <laughs> um, the darkness. Yeah, the well, it, the... yeah it, everything, you know, that's why I, I always, you know, years, years ago I said, you know, when you talk about things in terms of opposites, it seems like such a blunt instrument. And again, it, in this case, it's, it's again, Talking about um, the shadow itself is is a big sweeping concept that covers a lot of things. And you said, well, it's not necessarily um, as if 
somehow you were ex I was excluding instincts and so forth. But the the shadow is um, is the way well, you've said this before. You said it a week or two ago, or a month or two ago. The shadow, everything has cast a shadow. Yeah. And uh, so in everything, um, and actually the shadow. Let's say you had a wrong idea. Well, I don't want to get into anecdotal stuff. Um, they should do. Come on. No. <laughs> That's what these guys want to hear. Well, the whole thing was, and I brought this up, you know, a long time ago, is insight. And um, mm -hmm. uh, you've got insights and you've got blindness. And for every insight, that means you've made a selection and you've selected something and this makes sense to you. But in the process of making sense of something, you've neglected a whole bunch of other stuff. So that becomes the shadow of that insight. Right. Okay. So Fair enough. So you, when you, um, so when you're talking of darkness, you know, and that's that is going to always be what you you've cast aside in order to maintain your coherent self, which I'm talking mostly ego. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a whole thing too where you where, you, and I forget who says it. I've been reading too much, but you know, kill the hero, and that's kill the ego because you've got to uh, you've got to you've got to slay the dragon slayer in order to get back to the shadow, you know? Right, order. right. Otherwise, you keep slaying the dragon and you, right. you, you're you a hero, so, great, but you, right. you don't and, get and beyond so, so going what, to ball games and stuff. Right, so, what, so yeah, I mean, going no to ball games <laughs> is, is just pacifism or pacification, right? It's, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's like having a pacifier. Yeah, it is. It's but, also it's not, it's not growing. What's wrong with the hero journey? Okay, the, what's wrong with the hero journey is the hero journey is about um, your ego. your prime well ego and your primary um, type, whether you're whatever. And so, for Jung's point about the murder of the hero, murder of Siegfried was that um, all German men were taken up by this myth of this hero for Germany. It had to get beyond that. It had to get beyond that dominant um, attitude, okay, and, and allow the, the non-dominant side to come in, okay, and they couldn't do it. So. The result was we had World War One because that, that's what he was talking about in terms of the way of what is to come because he, he knew that they wouldn't stop and they would most German men wouldn't wouldn't cut off the could wouldn't cut off their Siegfried they would think of you know heroism so they'd go out and die for their country type thing, right and and so then when they were beaten then they wanted revenge, and and so then he was seeing the revenge coming up in his his clinical setting, and until you can kill off that requirement to be heroic for your country, and go back and say, ah, how do we have to live, you know, in order to continue the species? Okay. Really, I mean, what do we have to do? I mean, because we have to evolve ourselves individually. Right, we have to evolve ourselves individually. And or as in my next book will show, technology will take care. Technology will help help us. Really? Okay. <laughs> I think Skip is skeptical. <laughs> That's because Skip has no idea what I mean by technology. Mm -hmm. Well, th this is robotics. True. No, no, in fairness, nothing to do with any of that. No, in fairness, we don't know that. what Bill so is thinking. I mean, why would I pick something that's already been thought of? Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, so Bill is writing a novel, and uh, we don't know what his novel is about. So I, I'm not going to say anything about it. It's about, it, it, it's about finding the new God, the new God image. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Well, cool. I can't wait to read it. Cool. Can I get an autographed copy? 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're for it. We're for it. I'll get my stamp out. Technology can be anything. That's pen. That's technology. Sure. Yeah, so you sure. can be really interesting. Sure. Anything. I mean, anything. I mean, this, if I pick my nose, yeah. I fingers are technology. Okay. Exactly. It's just, yeah. So, so here, here's the point. Mm -hmm. Every, in terms of good and evil, everything that we can see in this room is the result of good. Okay. Everything that we can see in this mm -hmm. room, including the human beings and including the fake flowers. It's okay that we, you know. Is the result of good because it was adopted by somebody and somebody mm -hmm. was prepared to produce it. And they, we, and they were exploited and they got 10 cents a day. Well, no, whatever they were, yeah. But, it, but, but that 10 cents a day meant something to those people, right? Okay, they they ate because of that. Ah, uh, you okay. sound like a capitalist. <laughs> well, you know, look, okay, so I, I went to Bangladesh, and in Bangladesh, and I've been there several times. Um, but see, that's know, they, what put them in that position to start with. No, it isn't what put them in that position to start ah, with. No, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Let, let's, let's think about it for a minute. Okay. All right, fine. So I went to, I went to clothing factories, um, that had 10 year olds working there. Okay. But, um, you know, the truth is their families didn't have anything to eat. And, and you know, a hundred years ago in this country, we had people working in sweatshops in New York City. Okay. And still we have lots of poverty in the United States, right? And so depending on your point of view, 10 cents a day or whatever it is, is okay. See, that's like all political discussions. People start in the middle of a dialogue. I mean, people have been talking politics since the beginning. They'll start a conversation right in the middle of it, like this is, you know, they know where it starts and they know where it ends. Or It's an ongoing conversation. And of course, we're in the middle of some long process, but that's just, what psychic energy is. But, but you ahead. know, you can't. It seems to me that we're always. It's like we we kill and eat animals to sustain ourselves. We sort of kill and eat societies in order to sustain ourselves. So we're always, you know, there's always that. But we've got to, at some point, reach a point where we recognize human life as a species i mean are we going to always do that i mean yes. and if we yes. always we, do if we keep this win and lose mentality going we're not going to survive we're going to be dead well, and, we are, which may be any, just as any, well no anyway we're going to be dead because the sun is ultimately going to blow up and, yeah, and destroy the I'm earth not even right thinking that but, but here, here's the thing here's the buddhist thing Okay. Here's here's my mouth. See what <laughs> this mouth? Like this is be recycled this is skull like somewhere, <laughs> so I can count my <laughs> prayers, right? Okay. So in, in Buddhism, you know, all life lives on other life. That's a reality. Okay. That's what we get. Okay. I mean, I've been showing on the YouTube channel a picture of Saturn, this little blue dot. And I have an arrow pointed to it, and I say, you are here, okay? Because that little blue dot is where all life mm -hmm. that we know about up until now, every bit of life that ever existed, as far as we know, was on that blue dot. That's the deal. And the deal is that we, um, all life lives on another life. That's a Buddhist concept, okay? All life lives on another life. And... Um, okay. I okay. mean, that's 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 how that's, you want to deal with it. That's the way you'll deal with it. Well, you know, but the, okay. So what what's the alternative, Bill? Okay, is there a, an idealistic uh, alternative to living on another life? How are you going to? I don't know about idealistic, but there's other alternatives. No. How are you going to live beyond a week without? consuming something that has been alive. Well, what if what if all of the the senators and let's just assume everything was swept out of Washington and all the politics and we stuck women in there, for example. Don't you think things would change? Sure they way? would. Okay. 
Now, I'm not saying they would correct it, but there would certainly be change. Now, what if you, yeah, is, no, what if you were to find some the kind of... The question is, if it's all women in Washington, are you still going to eat steak or not? Um, I'm sure for the next 20 years and for a generation, there won't be a lot of change, but there will be a gradual change. In other words, I, it's sort of like with all those men in all those positions, it's sort of like a symbolically, it's like the way of thinking is stuck. Well, so if you begin to shift all those things out, which symbolically, you would begin to change the way we think. And well, we wouldn't be stuck and anymore. That is, that is and we happening. wouldn't have to think of things in terms of win-lose. We wouldn't have to think of things of, in terms of, well, if we can exploit these little brown people over here, we can, we'll have better cars over here, which we don't really need, you know. Well, I, but again, that's my opinion. I mean, somebody well, else would say, no. well, I need that car. But, you know, you know, but, the but why the do you get it at their how, expense? How do we get from here to there? That's or the issue. in New Zealand, here they've got this beautiful act, act, you know, water under the ground. Uh -huh. They've got all this aquifer, 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 aquifer under the ground, right? So these guys want to come in and uh, and, and put dairy farms on top of them. Okay. And so they're going to pollute this aquifer. And so these guys are going to walk off with all this money. Great. They'll be rich and they'll pass their money down to their descendants while people drinking the water will be getting sick and dying, you know, at, at an early death. Well, why do you get to exploit things like that? Why do we let people exploit things like that? Why do we exploit these little brown people over here for our, for our, you know, white walls? I don't well, know. I mean, but that's that's, that's, frivolous. that's the push and shove of the human. But it's win lose, and that's the kind of thing we need to get away from. Win lose is not a good, not a good uh, solution. We need something more on the word on the. That's and it's not even ideally it, it's just we've gotten we've had such a warrior mentality for so long we can't begin to see that there's you, you need to learn how to cooperate and how to exactly. how to negotiate okay. and get out of this mindset where if, if you didn't destroy someone you didn't win we don't have to you know right um, we don't have to all be trumps Right, okay, so the Buddhist answer comes in the sand mandala that I was looking at yesterday, where there's an elephant, and on the elephant there, and the elephant has a lotus, and on the top of the elephant is a monkey, mm -hmm. on top of the monkey there's a rabbit, and on top of the rabbit there's a bird, okay, and so, the, so there, it's called the four friends, and so the significance of this is that um, they can all live in harmony because the question is, you know, which came first and how did they relate to the lotus, which the which the elephant has in its uh, possession here? And the an the answer is, well, you know, the elephant came along and he saw the lotus uh, blossom and he took it because it's beautiful and. The, and so which came first so the monkey says well you know i knew that tree before it even had a blossom so i guess i came before the, the lotus and, and then the rabbit says well i knew that tree uh, when it was just a sapling and i was eating its roots and so i guess i i'm i know that tree earlier than you do and the birds says why well, ate a bunch of seeds and I pooped a couple out and the, those seeds became the, the bush or the tree in which the lotus came up. So I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm earlier. It's, it's like the old joke about the uh, three professions, the, the engineer, the lawyer, and the, and the doctor, and, you know, which, which came first and um, the engineer says, well, um, let's see, how does this go? Um, the engineer says, well, my, um, no, I'm sorry. The doctor says, the doctor came first because God created man out of Adam's rib. 
and that was obviously a surgical procedure and therefore medicine came first. And the engineer says the um, God created the heavens and the earth out of chaos. And that was obviously an engineering activity and therefore engineering came first. And the lawyer says, who do you think created the chaos? A <laughs> 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 oh, good one. You know, but but in, in the end, from a Buddhist point of view, all life lives on other life, and <coughs> and so, you know, it's well and good to have an idealistic opinion and. And mind you, I'm I'm on your side of the spec. I'm on your side of the spectrum, Bill. In terms, but of, anything uh, less than a Buddhist opinion is is uh, is idealistic. Okay. That's you're sort, of, sort of passing a judgment that 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 capitalist quote system is bad, right? So no, not necessarily. I'm just saying that there's there's overemphasis. It's not like there's it's out of balance. And a Buddhist would say you've got to find a middle way or something. Well, else. sure, and and so, and so we have to find balance, and and we are doing, and that's what we always do. And this, I, I don't think so. I think well, it exhausts itself. I don't think there is a middle ground found. I think it just collapses of its own weight, and then the middle ground is found. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like that. I mean, this is what yeah, Dr. Jung meant by the way of what is to come, okay, which is you can't decide, okay, who should win World War I and therefore save 12 million lives, and who should win World War II and say, save 150 million lives because it can't be decided logically, okay? It, it's, it's much bigger than the rest of us. So the point is that all of us bashing against one another um, is the way of what is to come. And that's the way it has always been on that pale blue dot viewed from Saturn, which is that everything that's living has been bashing together since the beginning of life and there's no answer you know as, as Gertrude Stein once said um, there ain't no answer there never has been any answer there ain't going to be no answer that's the answer okay it's all about psychic energy right uh, read my book <laughs> and, and and so your book has the answer. Yeah, but we're no longer. You, you, you can't. You can't. I mean, well, okay. You'll see. Well, that'll be good. I'm I'm looking forward to that answer. That'll be Yahweh. Well, that that I do. <laughs> Yahweh, the, Yahweh provides the answer. No, he does. No, okay. Yahweh's Yahweh's a low level. Oh, he's a low level. <laughs> Give me he's a low life. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. I was just going to say that I think that we all embrace that ide idealistic point of view and, and especially if we're immersed in the um, shadow aspects of a, of a system you know. but um, it's it's really it's almost like one has to tread in that area in the area of imagination because it's just not realistic from what I've seen, it's we, we we will have this like people think that slavery is abolished. I, I think slavery is just like war and other things. It just keeps coming back. Slavery is definitely it's never started. alive and and effective in the United States. You know what do you think all these private prisons are? That's pure slavery. I mean because what they're doing is they're they're selling the labor of those people in the, that are incarcerated for like 23 cents an hour, okay, yeah. to the Fortune 500, and what are they imprisoned for for 10 years? For possessing no, marijuana or something, something like so, that. So we, we abolish it in our imaginations, and we, we're calling it something 
we're really really doing the same thing only calling it something else in yeah other we're words, just the servitude name. that's back right in, that's back right. in the 18th century was sort of the same thing it's a mild form of slavery and right. so there are certain universal things that have to do with what you're saying is that something has to feed on something else well, well you know i think what you guys are saying is just pure pessimism and that's fine and what i'm suggesting is optimism i'm not suggesting idealism i'm just suggesting there is ways to change the way jung tells us to change is we've got to go through ourselves and each one of us has to find redemption within ourselves mm -hmm. and that's the way it's always been but i don't think that's necessarily the way it's going to always be or else we're going to all die soon <laughs> you, well, know. you make a good point though definitely i i, I know what you're saying and i, I think I there's think, ways out of it we, i don't think we have the answer yet and you know maybe we can find the answer well i think there are the people that do for, see the answer I just, I, but I think there are people who don't have to constantly refer to, you know, I, I used to argue this back in undergraduate school and I just, I quit because it was pointless, but people will tell me what the realities are, you know, and I'm going, well, the realities, <laughs> the realities have to change, you know, I mean, if you can't change reality, then we're basically doomed, so. And, and you know what it takes to change the reality? blood well see there's where we if, if that's what it takes we're doomed well yeah, we're I'm not doomed because because the reality changed after world war one and it changed after world war two but it took what's it gonna look like after world war three i don't know yeah well, i don't know but i but think the reality yeah. will well, change we'll be back to click and rocks together combinations. <laughs> through genetic combinations okay. yeah. well look you play the sticks, I'll play the rocks. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But 500, yes. You know, 500 years ago, we had the ch Catholic Church burning people at the stake be for yeah. crap like Galileo did. That's, yeah, know? that's after I mean, they... He got, he got Galileo him. was famous, so he got out of being burned at the stake. By by lying, well, they, by they swearing on a Bible, off, they killed a off the Gnostics too. Why do you think the alchemists had to go that route? Because they had to hide from the church. The church That's was right. an evil okay. organization. Right, it was an evil organization in that respect. Okay, but it was a good organization in many other respects. Right, and and so the reality is that that uh, Galileo lied on a stack of Bibles that the earth orbits the or the center orbits the earth okay he literally swore that and he made them monkeys for all time because he <laughs> because he knew they kept good records <laughs> and but but that's what the catholic church was doing 500 years ago we've come a little way since then Okay, it's been painful. There have been a lot of clashes back and forth. Yeah, but that's a thin sliver of humanity, too. It is. You're right. Okay. But, but, but the same token, you know, Hindus and Buddhists largely live in peace. Okay. And well, Pakistan and uh, India practically got their throats all in each other's throats all the time, and they're. Well, that's that that's Islam and Hinduism. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that's different. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is that the Hindus and the Buddhists have made it so that well, one sort of a well, subset of the like, other. Uh, one point three billion people can manage to survive on a couple of dollars a day. Okay, we can't do it here. Yeah, but survival is so pathetic, you know. Well, there's I, no creativity in okay. survival. Right, but there's <laughs> 7.5 billion of us, Bill, and, and most of them, most of us don't have the privilege of living like this and, and being able to talk to people online. That's a, but you know, it's like when people, a lot of times when people get rich, they say, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna feed it back in, and you know, bring other people up." And, I think that's sort of what you know, we, we... We've sort of lost that in the yeah. United States, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm losing power, so this session is yeah, be coming to an end. Anyway. And we have three minutes to get out of Sammy's, so I hope this has been a profitable conversation. Said, sorry you missed it. 
So the next event will be, do you have your phone, John? Because I'm using mine here. Yeah. Uh, one month. March, yeah, March the, 3rd or something. The, the yeah. first March. Monday in March. March 4th. That's March the day 4th. I moved. So, or it was, can start moving. You know, that's why it was the other thing. I knew there was an, a busy day. Are you going to okay. come from Aberdeen here? You're Aberdeen's far. Well, I will for one or two times anyway. We'll talk about it. Okay. We'll see how you it don't goes. I don't know what it's like. You I don't mean. want to live closer or you have to live in Aberdeen? Well, it's just... It yeah. is where it is. Yeah. Okay. It's an interesting option. Yeah. That's a very interesting option. Um, I would know. So it's March 3rd or March 4th? Fourth. March 4th. Okay, so March 4th, we will again be at Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen. And begin again next week, we'll, I'll be back yeah, my job, so at my okay. computer and it's paying fun. attention to the chat. Pardon? Nothing, nothing. I was taking time. We're good. I'm good. We're good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going there because of uh, uh, just some personal stuff I'm going through. Cool. And it will, I've got a daughter who's sick up in that area. Okay. And I've got, uh, uh, I, I've got a lot of transitional stuff I got to do got after it. the divorce. And it's a good place. It's, you know, it's where I need to be for a while. It sounds like a it sounds like a good solution. Yeah. Bill is indicating to me that I can go live on a military base. <laughs> <laughs> this could be interesting. I'm gonna go live on a military base. Um, Are you? Yeah. What fun? <laughs> what well, the fun? kids actually seem kind of happy. Well, it's fun. Well, it's secure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a, a gated community. community with good security. Yeah. Going on there. <laughs> anyway. Peace, thank you for joining us tonight. And, and, uh, we've, uh, I think, expended our, our time at Sammy's, so I'm going to have to ter terminate the session. Midnight, midnight, and I'm out of power on my cell phone. Oh, so I didn't know what you wanted. I uh, look forward to see you next week from yeah. my desk over in Annapolis. But uh, for now, uh, I'm going to terminate this session. So, nice. Yeah, it's probably going to be